Um, yes, I'm very pleased to have now the second session of our conference and uh, it's a great pleasure to first of all welcome um, our next speaker who came all the way from America as well. So uh, Timothy Campbell is professor of Italian studies actually and as we have already noticed uh, with Agamben the Italians are quite strong in this field. and. Um, of course, uh, alongside all the other accomplishments um, that uh, Tim has, um, I will only point out now a couple of things concerning our conference. So Tim has, has actually translated two very important thinkers uh, for biopolitics, and that is Roberto Esposito and um, Carlo Diano. And um, so, only by doing that, Tim is already a very important figure for all of us, um, but um, also because he is the co-editor of the most important um, biopolitics reader in English language. Yeah? So, the biopolitics reader with a very substantial introduction by Tim as well, of course. And so, therefore, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us um, as really one of the greatest specialists, very renowned in the world. And uh, Tim's title today is Enclosing the Pandemic, the Sacred, sacred and Non-Sacred Sites of the Biopolitical Event. Thank you very much for coming, Tim. Can everyone hear me? Is my, my microphone on? Yes? That's, <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the least important part uh, of my, my job. Um, so thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And my thanks to uh, Rali and Marcus for their efforts to make this conference a reality and for their incredible hospitality during these times of heightened anxiety. So, um, my considerations on the pandemic are really the product of two pieces um, that have happened recently. The first um, was something that Marcus mentioned, um, a translation that I did with, um, with Leah Turtis mm -hmm. of uh, a work by the Italian philologist Carlo Diano. The title of that, that work is Form an Event Towards an Interpretation of the Greek World. Um, there are some pages, I did, when I was translating, when we were translating it, it wasn't clear to me that it actually had much to say, I shouldn't say this, but it had much to say about biopolitics, honestly. Um, but then the pandemic arrived and lo and behold, uh, Diano seemed to offer some useful, more than useful, I would say some really insightful um, observations on, on the pandemic, in particular event. So that's kind of the first piece um, that uh, drew my attention um, when I was writing this paper. And the second occurred last year uh, during a graduate seminar I was teaching on biopolitics and the pandemic. And what I think kind of became clear to us anthropologically, I mean, I'm talking about myself and the students, um, which was a difficulty all of us had trying to gain some distance from the pandemic in order to probe it philosophically. Um, honestly, it felt um, just too close for something like an encounter, as Deleuze might say. So, in fact, uh, it seemed to many of us that the question of the form, the event of the pandemic might be taking, um, was linked, might be linked, I should say, to sacrifice but equally um, that that might not be the only approach. So this is coming out of, I'm indebted to my, to my, my students in that class, that there, there was a kind of a, I don't know, a desire to see is there another approach that wouldn't sort of be reinscribed in a kind of sacrificial paradigm. Um, and you, that already tells you that I'm gonna be talking about Agamben. Um, but hopefully, not only a government, right? Um, so in the time I have today, um, what I'd like to do is to say some words on event and form in the context of the pandemic. I want to see how Diano's term, uh, this one particular term he uses called eventic form, might both help us see the limits of a sacrificial paradigm 
And then what I'd like to do um, is to suggest a possible direction, a different direction, where these eventic forms that Diano speaks of might be on the way to, to forms that are less enthralled to the pandemic, to the event of the pandemic, and more to be inscribed according to um, what um, my friend uh, Roberto Esposito has called recently a kind of instituting uh, paradigm or instituting thought around the idea of the pandemic. So that's sort of the plan. I'll, I'll, I'll go through, gloss a little bit of, of Diano's idea of eventic form, since I imagine some of you, perhaps most of you, aren't familiar with it. Then, then I'm going to pivot to Agamben, um, in particular a couple of dispatches that he wrote going back probably to the spring of 2020, and then, and then move to this, the possibility of this other uh, approach. Okay. So let me lay off briefly um, uh, Diano's insights into form and event as he sketches them in um, form and event. So the book, uh, I should tell you, first appeared in 1952, uh, and it's considered to be one of the principal sources for a number of accounts of event, uh, which is obviously, uh, when I say event, what comes to mind is Deleuze, probably Leotard, certainly Sambadiou, and, uh, and Agamben himself. Diano was one of Italy's uh, premier classicists. He was a student of Giovanni Gentile and a deep reader of uh, Heidegger. I should mention that he was also involved in uh, the ministry education for the Republic of Salo, uh, who, after the war, was banned from teaching in the academy for a time for precisely that relationship. So he's not someone that comes with uh, a pristine uh, biography. So, um, in Diano's reading um, of Greek antiquity from Homer to the Stoics, event is key. Event for Diano does not mean any happening that occurs just sort of generally, everyday happening, but rather it is a quod cuque evinit, that which happens to someone and which has weight. That is, what has value for the one it touches. Diana will say more than once that it does not have, event, does not have a value in and of itself. This, uh, this observation of his resonates. Without a relation to a specific subject, event would be an empty concept. We can say this in a number of ways. Um, one way in particular would be to follow the lead of the Italian philosopher Remo Baudet, who was uh, a close reader of Diano. Uh, Baudet will say that event is lived and not thought. Event concerns the here and now of everyone to whom it is manifested, and simultaneously concerns the general context in which the event is inserted. For Diano, following Gentile and Heidegger, this framework is ontology, the fundamental sense of being. Okay, how? How does being relate to this framework in which event is going to be inscribed? So for Diano, the power of event fundamentally touches on the question of why. Why me? Why now? Why is this happening to me? It is the why asked by the subject of the event that opens to a larger field of shared ontology, or to ontological sharing, if you prefer, to what I take to be honestly one of the central pieces of the pandemic's effects on, on philosophy, on thought. And that is the need, not for everyone, but for some, some of us, to turn to the ethnographic or the anthropological um, to inform philosophy. Now form. So form, in Diana's analysis, is the defensive reaction to the event that all individuals, indeed all civilizations, uh, show. It is a mode, form, is a mode for limiting, controlling, and marginalizing chance by enclosing it with a certain kind of meaning or structure. And here's a, a quote. 
How do I get to my quote? Do I hit the space bar? Sorry about that. Just like the uh, program. Word, Which is Word, and it should just come right up there. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, great, thanks. Right, so here's the quote. Um, it's short, so I can read it. We can read it together. Mankind's reaction to the breaking apart of time and the open. <laughs> is there? Okay, thanks. Um, mankind's reaction to the breaking apart of time and the opening of space crea created by the event in and around him is to provide events with a structure and by enclosing them, normalizing them. Uh, what distinguishes human civilization as well as individual lives is the different kinds of enclosure that the uh, pericons, uh, uh, atmosphere, the ungebende, right? Surrounding space and time are given by them. The history of humanity and the history of each one of us is the history of these enclosures, sacred moments, sacred sites, taboos, rituals, are nothing other than forms of enclosing our sense of a primitive civilization is given by the spatial temporal picture in which the events are joined. Right. So there are many uh, things I imagine that one would want to add, to subtract, to compare, to object to. Um, there, is, uh, there is Badu and the exercise in fidelity perhaps that comes to mind. There's Hardin Negri on the biopolitical event right, that produces subjectivity and affect. And elements of what Tiano is, is proposing here rhyme with those, I think. But uh, most important, it seems to me, is how Diano wants forms to relate to events. So how do you relate a form to an event? The enclosures that he mentions, the sacred moments, sites, and rituals, for Diano, function as forms through which events are joined, made sense of, and in a word that lingers, for me at least, this, uh, the word is normalize. You can normal, normal, events are normalized through forms. Um, so maybe you're hearing um, what I think some who've read Diano here in this, and, and that is, is another uh, word for enclosure, myth. Um, and Diano does mention myth a myth's informative event. And, and I think it's clear that the kind of enclosures that Diano is talking about, they seem related to a mythic thinking that, for instance, Ernst uh, Kazira writes about. No? Um, what holds the interest and attention of myth, Kazira um, observes, namely the here and now of the particular case, the death of precisely this man at this particular time, end quote. So mythic thinking for Diano and, and Kassir um, appears to be a way of understanding the individual aspect of the event, which reduces it, and here is, uh, is Kassir writing this, to a personal act of the will. So mythic thinking is a way of reducing the event to a personal act of the will. Now this, Maybe one of the ways that uh, an event becomes normalized, though Diano doesn't follow up on that, that process, unfortunately. But I think what Diano and, and Cassier uh, do make clear is that there's a difference between a personal act of the will, the moment of decision in which the event touches me, I decide that the event touches me, and another in which uh, Cassier uses to distinguish mythical thinking from what he calls scientific understanding. So, in the case of COVID, that would be to make sense of the event through universal conditions. I'm talking about scientific understanding. So, if we're talking about scientific understanding in, term, in, the, in a time of COVID, for Kassir, it would mean what, to make sense of it through what he calls universal conditions. What would they be? The virus works like this, its effects look like this, it spreads like this. Right? There's no personalizing the event. Right? There's no personal act of will in that, in the way that he's described that. Um, myth's role is to personalize. 
to understand it empirically doesn't explain at all why this person at this point became infected or equally why they didn't. So in this relation, I haven't made this clear perhaps, in this, in this relation of form to event, uh, Diano gives it a particular name and he calls it the eventic form. It's the way that event relates to form. Um, and there's a particular reason why he calls it eventic, and I'll get to that in just a second. But basically, I think the point here is that the eventic form of the, of the pandemic, or the eventic forms, if you want, of the pandemic, will be found in attempts that personalize, that individualize the event, that highlight the actions we undertake purposefully, that bring us into proximity to the event, uh, or that keep us separate from it. The eventic forms occupy the region between event and form understood more platonically. Right? So eventic forms are not platonic forms. They are precisely between the form and the event because we can, con we can contemplate them. We can, as he says, we can practice them. This means that they can be, these forms can be molded over, they can be thought about, they can be weighed, they can be contemplated. In a word, they involve practices. So eventic forms involve practices. When seen from the perspective of eventic forms and mythical thinking, those who wear masks and who are vaccinated practice an eventic form. And here I'm not going to say form of life just yet. And I may not ever, I don't know. But it, I think what's helpful at this point is to leave form of life aside and to simply say practice an eventic form um, um, one doesn't want to experience or live the event of contagion of the virus, but the fact that one has adopted an eventic form makes it clear that the event is for me. For Diano, that's it. The event is an event because it's an event for me. It's happening to me. If it were not, if it were not meant for me, then why would I choose not to wear a mask or be, or be vaccinated? raises another question, which is, uh, does the same hold true for those who do not wear masks or who are not vaccinated? There are clearly purpose, uh, uh, purposive actions at work here as well, but they take place in the terms of an absence. Um, the pandemic as event is denied in favor of some other event that has yet to take place or perhaps another event has already taken place, or perhaps this other event has always already taken place. In this difference between one event and another that has yet to occur, or that has already occurred, um, doesn't lie choice or freedom, but rather competing visions or interpretations of whether COVID is an event for me. So, I, I mean, you know, I'm coming from um, an American context, for better or for worse. Oftentimes it's for worse. Um, um, but in an American context, what that means is that so often when we, uh, in, in, in the United States, it's, it's a choice about freedom is how some will frame it. I think what Diano is proposing here, or what my reading of Diano is hoping to propose, is that this is not about, it, it, this is not about that. This is about determining whether an event qualifies as an event for you. In other words, for some, the eventic forms of masks, vaccines, and social distance symbolize a greater concern for the health of the community or an understanding of how the virus spreads and the importance of protection. They literalize, these practices literalize that the event is for me. This leads to a conundrum for those who do not believe that the event is for them. How can I demonstrate that COVID is not an event for me? How can I show that the thing that you believe to believe in as a thing, that's Agamben's definition lately, is like, um, what is belief? It's, the, not, it's never just belief, it's belief in a belief that there is a thing, all right? Um, so the absence of masks, the failure to practice social distance, the refusal of vaccines, we are in the realm of negating that the event is an event. Eventic forms will be found not in mask wearing, for those that don't wear masks, but instead in the maintenance of earlier eventic forms, 
what might these be? Collective gatherings in rituals both Christian and capitalist, all based on subjecting the individual to another's will, and so perhaps hastening the event in which another's will can be done. This is, this is a key piece for mythic thinking. If I do become sick, it's God's will. This is a phrase I heard repeatedly when I was visiting um, the, Midwestern, the Midwestern part of the United States in January during in, in North Dakota in the, the third wave or whatever wave it was of the pandemic. Right? If it's God's will, it happens. Right? The act of not practicing safe distance, the practice of not wearing masks, the practice of no vaccinations are examples of mythic thinking. Now, um, um, what I, I'm, I'm struggling a bit on this, right? Because, um, and the struggle is, uh, just be honest, are, are only the examples, are the only examples of mythic thinking here on the side of those that don't wear masks and are not vaccinated? Or is there mythic thinking that happens among those that do wear masks and are vaccinated? And I think, I think the answer is that there can't be one without the other, right? So that leads to, um, it's, it doesn't lead to a, to a declarative statement. It rather leads to a question. If we want to distinguish between certain kinds of practices over here, right, and other, and other non-practices over here, do we do that through mythic thinking or not? Or what changes if we see that both of them are examples of mythic, of mythic thinking or eventic forms enthralled to the pandemic? Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So this, that's a nice uh, bridge to a gambin. Um, so let me, um, I need to, I had the same question, I think, as, as um, Michael earlier. I would need to... Two fingers. Oh, two fingers. <laughs> nope. No, oh, that's fine. Just need to... How did you do this? I just had to swipe repeatedly. Oh, if I use this, I can just, uh, oh, page down, got it. Thank you both. So um, here is the, um, here's a quote from Agamben, but the setup is this, the differences between eventic forms that I've outlined here may well be what's agitating in Agamben's uh, dispatch as he calls them, from, um, from 2020 in the spring, um, in this piece, uh, Medicine as Religion. Um, so here's what he writes. Uh-oh. Oh, you're going to ask me to do this impossible again. Okay, so there is a malign god or principle, namely disease, whose specific agents are bacteria and viruses, and a beneficent god or principle, which is not health but recovery, whose cultic agents are medicines and therapy, if this cultic practice um, up to now was, like every liturgy, episodic and limited in time, the unexpected phenomenon that we are witnessing is that it has become permanent and all-pervasive. It is no longer a question of taking medicines or submitting when necessary to a doctor's visit or surgical intervention. The whole life of human beings must become, in every instant, the place of an uninterrupted cultic celebration. The enemy, the virus, is always present and must be fought unceasingly and without any possible truce. So Agamben is saying, I think, that during the pandemic, medicine has extended its own rituals to such a degree that the time of the event has been stretched to unprecedented levels. Now, clearly this is meant to rhyme with his earlier arguments uh, that we've mentioned, uh, that Michael and uh, Danielle mentioned earlier about the state of exception. The event of the pandemic for Agamben is not to be thought in terms of an event that touches me directly, uh, that I might die from, but instead is to be found in new rituals around therapy and recovery. 
Um, the event of the pandemic for Agamben is not to be thought in terms of an event that touches me directly. So it's not the, the, the event of the pandemic is not an event in, for Agamben in Diana's terms. Um, but rather is to be found in these new rituals around therapy and recovery. The purposive action that underpins mythical thinking in this earlier perspective migrates, so in Kassir's um, distinction I mentioned earlier, migrates from science and universality over here to a more fundamental break for Agamben, um, which is the conflict among capitalism, Christianity, and uh, what's the word? medicine, uh, science. Right. So those are the three. So for him, the event is not an event for me. There's a, there's a, there's a, no, there's a different event. And that event has to do with a break in certain kinds of rituals, in these eventic forms, right? Um, so how does he do this? Uh, de what he does is he definitely leaves most of science alone in these dispatches. Um, but with a sleight of hand, he highlights how medicine and virology, in their taking of the human body as an uh, object, blur the boundaries between science and mythical thinking. Right, so medicine becomes a form of mythical thinking, or becomes its, it, it, its eventic forms link it to uh, mythical thinking. He says as much in the same dispatch, and I don't have it here, I don't think. Um, yeah, I'll just read it. Um, he says this in the same um, dispatch. It's not surprising that the protagonist of this new war of religions should be that part of science where the dogmatic is less rigorous and the pragmatic aspect stronger, medicine, whose immediate object is the living body of human beings. So the result of these transpositions that Agamben is undertaking are to individualize the event differently so that doctors and virologists are seen as usurping other cultic practices that before would have been used to enclose the event symbolically. What other practices are in conflict with the practices, um, the cultic practices of medicine? In an earlier dispatch, they appear to be linked to, uh, not surprisingly, Christian mercy. Here's a gamben. Quote, it is forgetting that one of the works of mercy is visiting the sick. It is forgetting the martyr's teaching that we must be willing to sacrifice life rather than faith, and that renouncing one's neighbor means renouncing faith. What troubles Agamben most about the epidemic is the possibility that treating COVID as an event will make it more difficult for the believer to sacrifice their life to show that faith, belief, have not been given up. What Agamben does not want to give up, it seems, is the possibility of sacrifice, of the acts of faith that point to a different event, one whose forms are not located in health or recovery, but in the possibility that one might lose one's life because of one's belief. That's, I think, at the, at the crux of this. So this, I think, explains in part why the late Jean-Luc Nancy's rejoinder to Agamben's invention of the epidemic last year, it remains so powerful. Yes, Agamben believes in the possibility of sacrifice and sees in the eventic forms of medicine a threat to what qualifies as an event. The fact that he advised Nancy not to have a transplant suggests as much. It also indicates something else, that the figure of a homo sacer that has been the subject of so many volumes and has launched so many dissertations um, on his part troubles him, not only because the homo sacer can be killed, but more so today because they cannot be sacrificed, that they cannot practice the eventic forms that matter most to Agamben's faith. Here's, um, uh, here's a, another quote. Uh, That's the last one I have. So I mentioned faith. You have to talk about belief. And that's, that's really the issue uh, for Agamben. Here's another uh, piece from Medicine as Religion. It, it's fa in fact, it seems to me that the, that the epidemic has shown beyond any possible doubt now, this is not from medicine as religion. This is from, sorry, from an earlier one. Uh, bear life and, the, the, pan, and uh, the pandemic. 
Um, in fact, it seems to me that the epidemic has shown beyond any possible doubt that humanity no longer believes in anything but bare existence. Not, it's, it's not nuda vita, it's bare existence, right? To be preserved as such at any cost. The Christian religion with its works of love and mercy and its faith to the point of martyrdom, political ideology with the ethos of unconditional solidarity, even belief in work and money. These all seem to have taken second place as soon as bare life came under threat, albeit in the form of a risk whose statistical extent was labial and deliberately indeterminate. What's interesting about this piece, um, as, um, as Warren Montag and Davide Terizzo have pointed out, is how Agamben turns bare life um, into belief. Um, whereas in his previous analysis, it appeared as the result of an apparatus, of a kind of anthropological machine. It wasn't, it wasn't a question of belief. The pandemic has made it a question for Agamben of belief. And it's, it's interesting that, it's, that the, the bare adjective has now been migrated to existence. Okay. So the fact that questions of belief are at stake suggests a final point, and it's that to I want to, I want to turn by way of conclusion. And it's a, the question is, is one um, I've already mentioned. Is there a way of thinking a different relation between the event of the pandemic and the forms, the eventic forms, that Agamben has sketched following in the footsteps of Diano, in which belief does not structure eventic forms. Can you, can you, is there another way to think about eventic forms that, that would not be structured around belief, a belief in whether it be medicine or whatever cultic practice you have in mind? Is there a way to repeat with difference so that the eventic forms of the pandemic are not to be found only in enclosure? Right? The thing about enclosing is that it repeats the language of sacrifice. It repeats the language of political theology. In that quote from Diano earlier, the, the, the enclosures are linked immediately to the sacred. Right? Um, but is there, is there a, a way to do this that, um, think, thinking the pandemic, not in terms of enclosure, but in terms of opening, or whatever that dialectical other of, the, of enclosure is? All right, so one way to do this would be to return medicine and virology to their homes within science. Right. The genie is out or something, right? But given the fact that in my own country, 30% of the population does not believe um, in um, vaccines or the virus itself for that matter, the result of mythical thinking that's ravaged um, uh, the country for more than even the last six years, I'm skeptical. Um, what about attempting not to identify the event as an event that is happening to me. If you don't identify the event as it's not happening to you, can you what, what, are the, what would you need to do to protect yourself from, from that event as being happening to me? Does something change if the event doesn't elicit an individual why me, but rather a why us? Well, in many cases, as you know, why us's are no less enthralled to sacrificial events than individual ones. So I'm skeptical, deeply skeptical as well about that. But interestingly, Diano, at the end of his account of event and form, uh, writes that, quote, one of the most obvious examples of enclosing of an event are those that employ names. Myth, and here he, f he finally introduces myth uh, near the end of, of his book. Myth, he continues, quote, is the figure of event which makes the archetype a ritual. There are rituals without being myths, but a myth isn't a myth without enjoying a relation to ritual and to the act of celebrating that ritual, in which only the myth can be lived as event. So, uh, what he suggests, what he's suggesting is downgrading myth to fable. And the way to do that, he says, is separating myth from ritual. If you do that, then its connections with the sacred are felt less. So, um, oh, time, shoot, thank you. Um, so that, I'll tie this up really quickly. Um, so some of, of 
of, of uh, Roberto Esposito's writings on institutions echo the importance of Diano's insights into names, um, while not e explicitly adopting uh, Diano's formula. So in, in this reading of institutions, in, this idea of institution presupposes a non-coincidence between the institutor and the instituted. And he's drawing on Merleau-Ponty and this idea um, that plural events can function as a foundation despite the fact that they don't operate kind of in sequence. Um, the, the, I, I, can, I, can, I can wrap this up um, pretty quickly. Um, I think for me the key, the key that from Agamben, from Diana to Agamben, and then to Esposito is what, what, really, what, what we really need to be thinking about is, 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 you, is being open to an event without it actually leading to kinds of eventic forms being practiced, right? It's only in that kind of refusal um, or an, an, an adapting, right, that doesn't immediately take you to a sacrificial paradigm, that you have something like a, uh, what, an institutive openness to the event. And I think it's there that, that we, we kind of find ourselves right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, um, I think indeed it was a very important aspect that uh, perspective that you opened us to us uh, to, up to us. Um, the idea of the sacred of rituals in all of this. Yeah, so this uh, plays a major role. Um, and I have already two questions. Yeah, so first was Michael and then Frank. Thanks, Timothy. Uh, so rich and. Um, so I'm not sure whether I, I understood everything. And it not, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's my fault if I didn't, because you were very clear. It's just so much information and so many threads that you tied together. Um, so, so my question, I have a question and a comment, I think. Um, one, let's assume, well, Myth, and I haven't read Diano, I have to admit to that, and, but I will, because I'm really interested in, in what you said about him. Uh, assuming, let's, if, if we agree on the fact that myth, just literally speaking, is a fable, it is the narrative, in terms of mythos, the Greek term. So whether we downgrade it or upgrade it, so it's a framework we impose to create order within chaos, one way or another. So whether you call the chaos event, unfolding life, so, but my, my question is, are we speaking about verbal agreements, verbal conventions, or real things uh, outside of language that are tied up with language? Uh, and then, depend, depending on how we describe them and the words we use to refer to that reality, and you know, we don't have to go into this question, is a reality possible outside of language? whatever it is, as soon as we come to illness and death, we know it is, let's agree on that. Um, then, what Diano says to me is really interesting, but what Agamben says in your rendition, definitively in a way, uh, well, how should I put it, refutes um, or uh, debunks or destabilizes whatever he has to add, because his thinking is, the way I understand it, in your presentation is purely analogical. So only because something looks like something else doesn't make it into that something else. So medicine might look like a cult or like a ritual. Right. It doesn't have to be. You're saying that that's, that's a dominant Yeah, question. yeah. You know, the ritual is the cult of medicine. And in particular, and so, my, and so yeah. my comment though is, so this was my question, is it purely analogical? My comment is, yeah. uh, or comment slash, que slash uh, question, He's simply, in my view, absolutely wrong in defining medicine as concerned with the living body and as a scientific enterprise. It, has, it is and has been an art. Medicine, unlike virology, is not a science. And that's why it changes. And its concern is not the living body per se, but an artful treatment of a way of life that is engaged with the living body. And so I, I don't think that it's possible to view medicine separate separately from the question of a form of life. And you know, wherever it leads us, um, yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. 
So there's the first question about, um, are these real things? Um, and I mean, certainly from the way that the drawing on Diano and, and, and uh, Kassir, there is language is, is we're, all, we're always engaging with reality through language. So that, that kind of question, I think, uh, certainly in terms of the way that Diano talks about naming things, n to name something is to, is to give it power, right? So it's certainly real. Um, the, the, but the larger question is about the, the medicine and Christianity and capitalism. So, I mean, you know, I, w I would agree with you that, that these are, leaving aside the question about art, but in terms of the way Agamben sees it, is he, I mean, he's, he repeats it on more than one occasion. These, these are, there's conflict. These are, this is, this is uh, it's a war. He calls it a, a re religious wars. Again, and to pick up on you, I think that's, Inflated, it's hyperbolic, you know. Um, um, but I think he, dis, dis, and he, he he's wrong. But at the same time, we mentioned this last night. I mentioned this last night at dinner. I mean, it's useful to just sort of okay, let me hold that for a second and sort of think. Okay, so what would it look like if there were this war? If if medicine were actually a religion, and you were to think about it cultic, as a cultic practice, where would that lead you? And, and I think what, what it, it's suggestive of a certain kind of thinking that permeates the way that some are thinking about or not thinking about the, uh, the pandemic. Leaving aside you know, the objections, I, I get it. You know, I'm not sympathetic, <laughs> trust me, I'm not sympathetic to to, to this larger project of Homo Sacher for all the reasons that, that you both laid out this morning. But it, I, I wonder though if, um, yeah, and there is a weakness in, in the way that he puts these together. I mean, analogically, it, it's paradigmatic. He's putting it's one thing next to another, next to another, next to another, and then sort of seeing where the, 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 the sparks fly. But um, I think on some level, you know, it's, it's useful for thought. That's not a great answer. Not even a good answer, but there you go. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, Diano's downgrading myth to fable. Do I get it right? This is a. Do you also think that this is an attempt, or a yes, an attempt to to rationalize, in a way, the the event, or would you think it's yeah? I mean, by by downgrading it to fable. And the second, just the first question is just. Did I get that right or not? Yes. And the second one would be, do you think it would make sense at all? I mean, uh, can we escape myth at all I, I'm, in the I'm, face of such events? This is a simple well, question, but uh, yeah, 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 no, I get, yeah. it just popped up. Well, I mean, I don't know. For, uh, I'm a, I consider myself a child of the Enlightenment, so I absolutely do. Um, but I, but, but, your, but the, I think the larger point here is, is about I mean, you know, it's an uncomfortable question, um, for me at least. It's, the, 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 and it's uncomfortable to ask, are there rituals associated with the way that uh, I, I am relating to the, to the pandemic? Is, is there, are there rituals that we have? And for Agamben, um, and, and presumably for Diano as well, there are rituals in the terms of putting on masks and taking off masks and vaccination and things of that sort. Is there an element there? I happen to... You know, I go back and forth on this. I, you know, I, um, because I am vaccinated, and I do wear masks, and I do, you know, I, I do practice these rituals. But um, there has to, be, it has to be. I, I wonder if there isn't a way to hold the rich, to hold these practices less ritualistically, right? Um, around around judgments about others. <laughs> and judgments around myself. And, and often I find, I only speak for myself, I find myself, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm the most judgmental, I'm the, the most ritualistic, not surprisingly. I want to, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I wanted to ask about this um, issue of uh, universality, universality, yeah. which yeah. I found very, important, uh, but I wanted to ask you if, you if you can expand a bit on that, as I understood some uh, in Badiou's terms, it would be the issue of event is how to articulate the singularity yes. and this universality, as I understand yes. it's uh, similar, so uh, 
issue here that you have the event must be for me, but at the same time, yes. uh, so the other recognize that I have, uh, I have taken uh, over so the event uh, yes. by the fact that I, I behave in a way which is kind of universally um, recognizable. Is it like that, for example, with masks, masks yes. I, I vaccinated? Yes. But then you were mentioned, you were arguing uh, that the problem in the present situation is exactly this, that uh, is it right so to do so? And then I ask, what, what becomes of this universality or where, where is the, yeah, I, I think so I mean, the problem was, with, is it science or is it somewhere else? Yeah, and that, that's, that's exactly sort of my hesitation on this, um, is at what point, or, or the, 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 at what point does the, these, pra these practices of eventic forms, at what point do they, are they more enthralled to, um, to a kind of a myth as opposed to something else that, that is more along the lines of what you're describing, which is the kind of the universal understanding, the scientific. Right. I mean, that's the question, and and I don't know. I mean, I think you. I don't. Again, it, it, this is what I meant before when I said that philosophy seems, at least for me, it needs to be ethnographic. You know, it's it's the recounting of the event for me, and not every day the event is the same. The event involves me or doesn't involve me. It's never just. You see what I mean? And so, at some points, the the eventic forms don't seem. They seem to be. You know, simply forms of protection that don't involve kind of this ritual, ritualistic thinking or around certain kinds of myth. Um, and other times, they clearly are. Um, and uh, just, I, I know that, right? So um, it, it's, this is part, I think, what's so, what's so treacherous about the, about this, about the, the pandemic is for, for, for those, you know, for those of us that are contemplating it and why it's so difficult is at what point does the event turn into an eventic form that's based around a myth. Uh, a myth that, you know, I'm protected and you're not, right? Um, I don't know if that, uh, that helps. Uh, um, very quickly, maybe a last question by myself. Um, the rituals obviously fulfill a good function as well. We yes. need rituals in life, yeah? So um, if we stick to the example of wearing masks, obviously that is a ritual. And I think for many people, at least, not for everybody, but for many, they do that very explicitly um, as a ritual. They don't necessarily believe in it, uh, you know? I mean, it's very questionable, you know? It's, it's medical value or whatever. Um, but they do it anyhow because they want to set a sign. Yeah? So they sit on their own in a car and they wear a mask or they walk at the beach on their own wearing a mask because they want to, well, first of all, they are afraid of punishments, but then they also want to have this symbolic value of it. So I recognize the situation. I'm part of this solidarity that we have constructed around this entire event. So they make it an, an event with those kind of forms. So I think that's very useful to think what's going on. Um, but if we oppose that now to mythic thinking, I find it very problematic. And you said as well that you have your doubts about that because obviously it's a choice, it's a decision. At some point you say, well, I appropriate this event as mine and I subscribe to it by having these kind of eventic forms. Um, so this is very mythical in many ways. It's a decision if it's not based on what uh, Daniela mentioned, on universalistic uh, scientific values or so. So the consequence of all of this, if we want to really come to a conclusion, would be we would have to have a real um, scientific academic um, procedure in order to determine what is mythic and what is not. And that would be a real debate of different opposing positions, because there are opposing positions on what is mythical and what is not about these rituals. So that's what is needed. And very strangely, very quickly, that has been completely suppressed in the public discourse, in the discourse of politicians, of the media, and so on. And I think that's the entire drama about what's going on. And that makes this entire event that lasts for one and a half years now um, to um, to biopolitics in the very bad sense. Because if it was something that was debated in a real 
open-minded discussion on what is right and wrong, then it would be fine, then it would be a democratic process. But if there is only um, a decision, well, this kind of camp has the voice, the public space, and the other is excluded, then it's not. Then it's not democratic, then it's not scientific, then it's not academic, then it's just myth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you the last word on that, because I think that that's, that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's well said. <laughs> All right. Well, then a big hand of applause for Tim. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>